Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to start right at the top of the hour, and those of you who are coming in getting lunch, just take a seat. Um, the topic today is corporate finance, and I thought I would actually begin. This is the story that the technical glitches prevented me from showing you yesterday, and there's actually a better version in this morning's Wall Street Journal. So I thought it would be a good idea just to put this up on the screen, point out a couple of things. So a contract was signed yesterday, and there was a big announcement, and the company involved is the DTCC, the Deposit Trust Clearing Corporation, which does a lot of the back office clearing and settlement, not only for equity trades, but for many of the financial markets in the U.S. And just to walk through some of the main points, um, it says, following a series of tests, the DTCC has picked a startup company called Axion, Axony, to use a blockchain, which is the networking system for digital currencies, to start tracking credit derivative payouts between big banks. Now, who is Axani? The investors behind it are Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and other banks. So this is a front organization for the established players, and the IT company that's going to run this thing is called International Business Machines. So, what you're seeing is the legacy players moving in on this very rapidly. And admittedly, like the rest of us, they recognize the value of it, but also see a threat to their existing business. If they don't get out in front of this, somebody else will. So DTCC has been considering other means to cut costs and to speed things up, but they've struggled to find something that could withstand the rigors and security needs of Wall Street. Now, it says, the blockchain is proving that it can be that tool. A lot of people are talking about how they're going to make us disappear, says the CEO of the DTCC. But here we are, one of the first users of the technology. So it talks about the business that they have about a million credit default swaps with a face value of 11 trillion. And what they do is to track who owes money to who and when they actually make payments. So this is the kind of thing that you never give much thought to, but it involves many, many people doing a pretty boring job on Wall Street. And their internal estimate is that using the blockchain could cut the cost of this by close to half. So there's a 50% cost reduction. This is the kind of first order thing that really changes the face of markets. And make no mistake about it, far fewer people are going to be employed and those that are will be doing a job that's really quite different. And the banking industry's hope is that these are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the savings, that there's been more than a billion invested in blockchain projects since last year, et cetera. So I think this article, which you can download and read yourself, is a sign of the times, and it echoes many of the important points that I made in the presentation yesterday. Now, for today, I want to talk about corporate finance, and I thought I would show you a slide from one of my colleagues' research papers. This is a paper by Thomas Philippon, also a professor in our department at NYU Stern, and he's put together a time series going back for about 130 years into the 1880s, looking in a very broad sense at the cost of financial intermediation. So if you borrow money from a bank or issue equity, to the market or something, there is almost always a middleman taking a cut. And some of these transactions cost more than others. But if you take a very top-down look at the cost of finance, um, what he's measured here over an extremely long time series is that to raise money in the 1880s cost about 2%. And to raise money in the 2010s also costs about 2%. In other words, there's been no improvement in productivity in 130 years, despite the arrival of things like the telephone, the computer, you know, all kinds of technology that arguably could have been used to improve this. So my colleague Tomas talks about this as the fintech opportunity, that there really is a desperate need for technology to come reduce the cost of financial intermediation, probably by orders of magnitude, and leave that money in the pockets of savers and investors, basically reducing the cost of capital, both for households but also for businesses. And the hope of the entrepreneurs in this area is that te technology will basically accomplish exactly this by making it much easier to raise money. 
Now, I want to focus Oh, one other way to think about the context of this. If you look at Bitcoin by itself, multiply all the Bitcoin circulating today by the market value of one coin, Bitcoin has a market cap of about $14 billion. That's sort of the face value of all the Bitcoins circulating right now. How can you justify this with reference to some economic benchmark? Because Bitcoin has no cash flows associated with it, and unlike things like gold or other forms of money, it's not obvious that it has other uses. But you can look at the payments industry and the market cap of companies like Visa and American Express, who are basically payments processors. You can look at people who make ATM machines, like NCR, the software companies, companies that do money transfers like Western Union, et cetera. This industry has a worldwide market cap on the order of about a half a trillion dollars as of 2014. And Bitcoin right now is 3% of that. Now, in the future, it's not obvious that Bitcoin will be the channel for money transmission, but maybe it will. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. But if you think about this as a disruptive technology, these are really the people who are vulnerable to disruption more than anybody else. And it suggests that Really, there's a lot of upside to this new technology, that if it's successful, it may take over an economic space that people value worldwide as being worth on the order of a half a trillion dollars. We'll wait and see, but I think this is a very useful benchmark. Now, what are we going to talk about today? I want to look first at the idea of a company going public and issuing equity on a blockchain and what this might change from the point of view of shareholders, of the company itself, people like shareholder activists, of managers of these companies and so forth. And I think really there's quite a bit that would be different. Um, I'm going to show you five or six slides and these are really based on an academic paper that I've recently written on the topic. And I think a lot of this is purely speculative, but in 10 years or 20 years, the equity markets might behave very differently. And it's interesting to imagine how this might affect the balance of power between shareholders, managers, analysts, and other people who populate the markets. I want to move past that and talk about some other topics as well and maybe spend about 10 minutes on each of these. So accounting, which I mentioned a little bit yesterday, there's an idea for making accounting something done on the blockchain on an open ledger basis where everybody could see each other's transactions. It's a radical idea, but it's one that would completely change how people do auditing and the temptations to cheat and forge books. Um, we'll see if this is a utopian idea or a realistic one, but it's one of the more interesting things I've seen in accounting research in quite some time. We'll talk about smart contracts, which are a different kind of derivative security. These are contingent securities that execute themselves according to computer code. And while they have great potential, also enormous problems can happen and already have happened in this area. And then, um, time permitting, a little bit about the governance of blockchains themselves. Um, Bitcoin is a very decentralized, open blockchain. It's an organic democracy where people can propose things and see who likes them. Other blockchains are controlled by gatekeepers or cartels or coalitions. And just as we think about the organization of the stock exchange and how stock exchanges are governed and who has the right to unwind trades or arbitrate disputes, many of the same questions need to be asked about blockchains. If, if markets are going to migrate onto these platforms, the way we organize them and who has the decision rights and so forth, I think is going to be a major regulatory issue going forward. So it's a lot of material. I may end up spilling some of this over into tomorrow. But I think a lot of these are really important questions. So how would you go public on a blockchain as opposed to the traditional stock markets? There's basically two ways you can think about this. Um, one is that many of the stock exchanges themselves may migrate in this direction. So I talked about the Australian case as being probably the first, but others may be following close on their heels. So by default, it may be that most companies end up going public you know, in the next five years or 10 years in a very different way. And um, this, I think, would, would be interesting. It would apply across the board, really, to all firms in a market. The other thing you could do, though, is to just start your own blockchain. And to date, one firm, this company, Overstock.com, has done this 
back in November. But there's certainly the potential that other entrepreneurial startups, I've suggested many times that firms like Uber and Airbnb may be thinking about doing this. And you would really bypass the existing market infrastructure and just issue shares on a peer-to-peer -peer basis directly to the market. Now, there's also a middle ground, which is sometimes called colored coins, free riding on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, what exactly is meant by this? This is a slide that I showed yesterday, and I said that what you see here is the raw data that goes into one Bitcoin transaction, which is the address from which it's being sent, the address it's going to, how many Bitcoins are being sent, and so forth. I skipped over this block that I've highlighted here in orange, which is called the data field. You might think of this as being very similar to the memo line that you have on a check, where you can write charitable donation or son's tuition payment or whatever it is. In the memo field of a Bitcoin transaction, you can also put additional information. So that video of the baby that was born in Argentina was actually uploaded into this field. It was digitized and then you know, put in a series of zero and one bytes and so forth. You could also put 100 shares of General Electric stock with the following QCIP or serial numbers or something like that. Or you could put the title to your automobile with a VIN number or any asset at all that you wanted to convey from the buyer to the seller and create an indelible record. What the Bitcoin would do is essentially be a token. And so the idea is that you wouldn't send 12 Bitcoins, but maybe 0.00001, some trivial fraction of a Bitcoin from person to A to B. And it's really not the Bitcoin tra transfer, but the information in the memo field that is significant. And so this is called colored coins because you're taking Bitcoins and making them red or green or pink based on whether they are IPOs of a company or Marriott points that you want to give to some other account holder or you know, God knows what else. Really anything else that has value and is tracked on a database, if you want to transfer it indisputably and securely, you might be able to piggyback it onto a Bitcoin transaction and have more confidence in the reliability of the data than the way you would transfer it under the system that you have now. Now, if you follow this idea through to its logical conclusion, you end up with one big blockchain in the sky. You know, a major data artery, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, that is really not so much a digital currency, but an artery through which all financial assets are flowing, with Bitcoin being the mule or the token. I think that there are many attractive aspects of this model. Um, the two big ones are that, first of all, this thing has proven itself. For eight years now, it's been extremely robust. And unlike a new platform that you might start, there's a lot of faith in the robustness and technical integrity of this. And then the second point is that you get standardization. If there's one way to transfer all assets, it greatly reduces the cost of transactions, communications, and so forth. I think you know, these are both extremely powerful arguments that you might want to move in this direction. The problem, however, is that the network as currently configured doesn't have the capacity for this. Bitcoin has some constraints. And probably the most obvious is that you can put only about 2,000 transactions into a block, and there's only one block per 10 minutes, which is seven transactions per second. That's not even enough to accommodate the people in this room and your economic activity, let alone the whole world. So you would greatly need to scale up the network. And whether this is even possible, and if it were, how you would go about doing this is a matter of great dispute. I will hopefully circle back to this topic by the end and talk about something called the Bitcoin block size debate. But even today, Bitcoin is pretty much at capacity. You need to have bigger blocks with greater frequency. But to get consensus on how to do this and to compensate the people who would lose from this, who are the miners who are making money off the current configuration, this has proved to be a really tricky problem. And we're now in almost the second year of a deadlock where people can't agree on how to fix this. So I find this colored coins model very, very attractive. But I think to get from here to there is not going to be the easiest thing in the world. Now, 
what you're really trying to do with all of these approaches is simplify what is an incredibly arcane system for trading shares of stock. This is a graph that I took straight out of the DTCC's own publicity material where they're trying to explain the logic of the current system that they have. So this is just a regular trade. Go to the exchange today and buy 100 shares of Microsoft or whatever. And this is the number of days it will take to settle the trade. So it actually takes three days. And the number of steps it goes through, which I believe is seven. And there's all kinds of novations and offsets and dispute resolutions. People have to post collateral. This is an incredibly cumbersome system. And I don't think anyone designed this on a pad. I think this is something that evolved over time, that as things went wrong, they decided to make it even more complicated. I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that said, if you look back to the 1890s, every day at 3.30, young messenger boys pushed wheelbarrows with slips of paper through the streets of Wall Street you know, at a breakneck pace to get them by 4 o'clock. You know, and said that system was cheaper, more accurate, and more effective than the system we have today. And so what you're trying to do is to you know, just go to a system where people trade directly. And you skip all these steps in the middle. The people at Overstock.com with their private blockchain have named it T0, which is a reference to this timeline. You know, they say, we don't want to settle the trade at T plus 2. We want to settle the trade right now. Now, what's going on here is compensating for really two things. There is fraud in the system. And a lot of this is designed to screen out dishonest people who try to subvert the markets. But there are also honest mistakes, things that, for instance, are called fat finger trades, where somebody puts an extra zero on a trade or in, you know, an extra three zeros. And instead of buying a million, they buy a billion worth. You know, and, and then this crashes the market and things close down. We have procedures for intervening and settling these things, basically to protect people against their own stupidity. And sometimes you know, these things cause the entire market to, to rewind or cancel trades. Sometimes not. But it's an expensive system that's designed really for the large majority of honest, well-behaving, responsible people to subsidize the careless few and correct their mistakes. You don't have any of that in a system like this. So one of the fun things about Bitcoin is that there's no way to reverse a trade. That if someone makes a mistake, it's a mistake. And you have to live with the consequences of your own actions. You might approach the other person and apologize. For, I'm sorry I sent you the billion dollars. Could you please send it back to me? But basically, you require the mutual consent of the two parties. And you're only going to get your counterparty to cooperate if they want to do it for reputational reasons or out of the goodness of their heart. Now, is it better to have all these layers of protection or to have a system where we all have to eat our own cooking? Um, it's a very interesting question. And I think in the future, rather than saying one is you know, going to be the standard, you're going to have both in parallel and people sorting themselves into clientels based on their own view of their own personal responsibility. But the cost of this system in the background is that we're all paying spreads and commissions and fees that in the large majority of trades are needless. Now, if we did move to this new world where everything was done on a peer-to-peer -peer blockchain, I think the number one change that would really cascade across several aspects of corporate finance would be much greater transparency of ownership. What's true about the blockchain is that you can look at it and see at any point in time who owns which assets. And every time a trade occurs, you can see who sold how many to who. This is something you cannot do today in the stock market, even if you wish to. And it's information that, if it were available, would be extremely valuable, not only to shareholders, but to managers, to regulators, and so forth. We have instead a system of filing deadlines. For instance, institutional investors report quarterly how many shares they own. When managers trade, they have to report, but they have a 48-hour delay. Um, other people are able to hide behind intermediaries and so forth. But with a blockchain, you'd have a degree of transparency that I think would greatly change the balance of power and the flow of information into the market.
It would have very serious impacts on things like liquidity, the accuracy of stock prices, the signals given to people about where they should be investing. And a lot of this is extremely complicated. To really get into the details would take many additional lectures to parse some of the hypotheses and the theories and so forth. But I think there's no question it would be different. Now, a few qualifications are important from the very start. That first of all, you don't see people's identities directly. You see their digital wallet addresses. And you would need a way to connect digital wallets to people. I think in the end, this is not terribly difficult to do. And you would expect companies to go into this business of being identity sleuths or providers. And, and in fact, these people already exist in the market today where they um, you know, essentially consult for people and try to figure out who owns which assets and who's selling them to who. A second point is that it really matters whether you're talking about an open blockchain or one of these gatekeeper permissioned blockchains. In an open blockchain, like Bitcoins, everybody really could see everybody else's wallet. There'd be literally no privacy. In a permission blockchain, in principle, you could probably restrict who could see what information. And in fact, if you talk to the people at R3 and at the other consortiums, this is the main preoccupation of the people involved, is that they are interested in this technology, but only to the extent that they need to be able to be sure that not all the other people can see their clients' trades and so forth. Now, why are people so obsessed with privacy, I think there's a number of good reasons. Um, some of this information is just valuable for competitive reasons. Some people just you know, want to be unknown to the market. And in countries of Western Europe, there's many aggressive laws about things like the right to be forgotten and the right to get your picture taken down from Google and things like this. And um, it's easy to see that the blockchain wouldn't necessarily be in compliance with these laws. So there's a lot of regulatory concern. But I think there's also just plain old risk aversion, that people are afraid to make data available in a way that hasn't been done before. And for that reason, many of the banks are extremely cautious about how widely and when they're going to implement this technology. So I think it's going to take some wildcat disruptors who have a different view of some of these issues to lead the way. And the question is going to be, for many of them, is the savings and cost you know, reducing my cost of equity worth surrendering the privacy of my shareholder register. And we'll see, I think, many people wrestle with this in the years ahead. Now, who's going to be helped and who's going to be hurt by this? I think an easy group to think about are the shareholder activists who buy positions in companies and then try to agitate for change to either throw out the managers or get higher dividends or more leverage or whatever. So I've put up a picture of William Ackman. He runs Pershing Square Capital in New York and is probably the leading shareholder activist. But this is a large community. People like Carl Icahn and so forth have been doing this for many years. And as a group, these people, in my opinion, are a force for good. Most of them stand for strategies that will raise the share price, hold managers more accountable. They select as their targets, I think, the worst companies with the laziest managers. We don't necessarily want to hurt these people or discourage them. But they would lose the ability to hide and surprise managers. Under current law, if you are a shareholder activist, you can buy up to 5% of the company secretly. And then even then, there's a further 10-day grace period before you have to publicly file. So in those 10 days, you're going to furiously buy every share you can. They would be able to see Ackman coming from a mile away, basically from the first trade. And this would give management not only more time, but also the ability to outmaneuver them in the court of public opinion, to, to recruit adversaries, um, their own colleagues, and so forth. It, it would change the game of shareholder activism. And Probably not for the better. So this would be a very indirect cost, but in the long run, probably a very, very important one. That in a blockchain market, activists might play much less of a role. Now, if I'm a company thinking of going public on a blockchain, maybe this is actually attractive to me. That I could go public on the New York Stock Exchange and have to live with these people knocking at my door if I do a bad job. Or if I could go public on a blockchain, I know Ackman's just going to avoid me because he can't operate in secret. You know, and so this may, ironically enough, become a type of a takeover defense. 
to make your shareholder registry as, as transparent as possible to discourage people you know, knowing that they won't be able to take you by surprise. What about the managers? We talk a lot about pay for performance and that the CEO should have skin in the game and that we want to motivate managers to think like shareholders. And the way we go about this is really by paying them in shares and options. And we permit managers a certain degree of legal insider trading. You know, insider trading, at least under certain conditions, is very much against the law. But a lot of the time, it's viewed very benignly. And there's every expectation that when we pay managers in shares and options, eventually they'll liquidate them and, and realize some of the fruits of their labor. The ability of managers to make money off of this system would be greatly reduced. You would see, again, from the first trade that every time a manager sold something, this is more or less like requiring them to pre-announce their trades. So it would take a lot of the percentage out of the game for managers. And there's a whole range of tricks and chicanery, things like the backdating of stock options, which I've done research on years ago. So that's what this picture shows is retroactively this one CEO was able to give himself options when the stock was down in the tank, and then it, it looks like it motivated him to do wonderful things, but he was just looking back over his shoulder and, and stealing money, more, you know, not to put too fine a point on it. All of these things would become pretty much impossible. You would you know, not be able to manipulate the system and use tricks that are hiding behind the weakness of the disclosure rules and again, this would kind of take a lot of the percentage out of the job for the CEO. Um, managers often unwind their position secretly by entering into equity swaps and other derivative transactions with Wall Street firms who are willing to swap them the rate on treasuries for the rate on your stock. This is something that should be disclosed, but is believed rarely to actually, you know, the compliance is very low. You'd be able to see all this. You'd even be able to see situations like when the CEO of Coke decided things are going to go bad, I'd better buy Pepsi to hedge my human capital. We don't know anything about managers investing in each other's stocks because there's no required disclosure, but all of this would become transparent. So I think for managers, basically they would hate this. And shareholders would you know, view a lot of these reforms as, as long overdue and so forth. But you would lose something very important here, which is the ability to use equity compensation to give these people deltas that motivate them to raise the share price. Incentive compensation would become a less effective tool. And I think what you'd have to do is raise the pay of the managers to compensate them for what they've lost. And this would be a very ironic outcome that this, you know, what do we get from the blockchain? Less shareholder activism, higher executive compensation that nevertheless is less effective. Um, this is not obviously stuff that we want. A third area is shareholder voting. And U.S. corporate elections are rigged. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. The system is rigged. And it's unbelievable how bad it is. And I'm not just making this up like Trump. There's some very good academic studies like this. Um, if you look at the distributions of votes scheduled by management, the number that get 47, 48, 49, 50, 50 you know, it's, there's no reason in the world that that shouldn't be a continuous series. But management has enough tricks to push these things over the goal line and barely win far more elections than they barely lose. So this is a real problem in corporate governance. And without going into any of the details, the fix would be a better voting system, which management has absolutely no incentive to want to bring into play and so forth. But blockchain elections have been touted by many people as a much more accurate way of doing this whole thing. And the interest in this is really not limited to the corporate world. There's a lot of people that think blockchain voting should be done in political elections as well, especially in governments where the technology and monitoring of the ballot box is open to question. Now, how would this work? You would give every eligible voters a token 
which they would then mail to the eligible candidates. So in the presidential election, you would get a voting token, and then you could mail it to the blockchain address for either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or even Gary Johnson or you know, whoever you wished. And you would just be able to count the votes this way. You would know the result immediately. You would not need recounts. Voter fraud could be screened out at the distribution of tokens, et cetera, et cetera. And this system seems both cheaper, more accurate, and very compelling. I, and again, I think the case is even stronger in political elections. And there's a lot of interest from this in third party NGO groups around the world who are pushing blockchain voting as a potential reform against corrupt governments in all kinds of places. So you may want to read more on that further. But the good news is that this is happening very actively already. The NASDAQ owns the Estonian Stock Exchange. And in the year 2016, they just announced that all the voting in Estonian corporate elections will be done on a blockchain. This was like a bolt from the blue. And Estonia is one of these wired countries. Some, you may not know this, but Estonia is like the most digital country in the world. And they have this national smart card that you can use for everything from your tax refund to you know, enrolling your kid in school, going to the hospital, whatever. You can use this card for shareholder voting, too, in elections. And I asked the question, you can even get one of these as a foreigner, that if you are a US holder of Estonian shares, you can go to the consulate and they'll give you one of these smart cards, which might be a good idea. Um, now, it's not much of a stretch to see that the NASDAQ would want to migrate this system to the real market that they own in New York. And in the US, a lot of this is outsourced. There's a private company called Broadridge that counts the votes in about 85% of all US elections. Broadridge has become a big blockchain evangelist. There's, if you Google Broadridge and blockchain, they are actively developing this for use in US shareholder elected elections. So I think within you know, maybe a year or two, you're going to start to see large numbers of US companies on the regular exchanges beginning to have shareholder voting on a blockchain. Now, this will solve a lot of problems in corporate governance, where management really does manipulate these elections in a particularly unappealing way. And it would provide just basic information about like who are my shareholders? And interesting research questions about how votes are traded on days of elections. There's all kinds of areas of corporate finance that are kind of grouped together under the heading of empty voting where people hypothecate voting rights through derivative transactions. And whether this is good or bad or even legal is very controversial. But you'd be able to observe it and get a much better fix on how much of this is happening, what the consequences are, and so forth. And as somebody who's a specialist in the governance area, I look forward to this. I think this is a great reform. It's hard to object to it on any basis other than that you know, I don't want the I, I'm benefiting from crooked elections, and I want them to stay crooked. But for most shareholders, this is a quick and easy reform that I think is, is much closer than, than any of the others to actually happening. Okay, let me move on now to accounting. And I want to talk about a proposal. You can read about it in this internet manifesto that was posted about two years ago. And it's summarized here by a man named Richard Jendel Brown. He is one of the early promoters of distributed ledger technology. He worked for many years at IBM in the UK and is now one of the chief people at R3, the big consortium of banks. And he says you can imagine a possible future where books are kept in a completely different way by companies, that all firms would record their external obligations and claims on a single ledger that would be shared and massively replicated. So the way accounting works today is that every company has its own ledger. And they have auditors who decide about things like depreciation schedules and how to expense things and when and when to write off obsolete assets. This is very different, that every time you transact with somebody, you and the counterparty would mutually agree on the form of the transaction, enter it into the ledger, and everybody would then be able to draw down the raw data and make their own financial statements. So I call this real-time accounting because, among other things, it's not beholden to a system of quarterly earnings or fixed reporting periods. 
you would just continuously record your transactions on the ledger. And anybody who wants to lend you money or evaluate your credit, um, research analysts, vendors, whoever, they can just pull down the raw data and do your balance sheet today or you know, eight weeks ago or any time that they wish to. And if I want to know your earnings, I could look not at the last quarter, but really at any period that I thought was relevant. And if I don't agree with your view of the depreciation schedule, I can make my own depreciation schedule and you know, correct the biases that you're probably imposing on the data and so forth. The goal here is to screen out the enormous number of moral hazard problems that we have in accounting. You know, it's well known, and I think you guys have learned in all the accounting courses you've taken here, that firms behave opportunistically, that companies characterize their transactions in the way that benefits them and, and makes their statements look as positive to the market as possible within the limits of the existing rules. And often those rules have an awful lot of wiggle room that people take advantage of. And there's all kinds of crazy turn of the quarter effects that a lot of financial asset management companies own shares on the last day of the quarter and then sell them on the first day of the next quarter. Um, banks are in compliance with their capital regulations probably four days a year, you know, which are March 31st, June 30th, you know, and so forth. And then because the other days don't lead to audits and measurement periods, they go do whatever they want. So all of these kinds of problems would be defeated by a system like this. And it has many, many interesting advantages to it, one of which it's much cheaper because you don't have to hire auditors at every company and third-party auditors to check the books. Now, the costs are, I think, also easy to spot. One is that you would put a lot of private information in the public record. Your competitors could see everything you were doing. But this is not new. In fact, if you go back to the 1930s when the Securities Acts were introduced in the United States, there was huge protest by companies on the stock exchange that forcing them to file annual reports with their balance sheets would give away the store and that you'd never be able to compete in a world where everybody, you know, and we're well past that, of course. Um, there's a school of thought, which in fact is often attributed to this university, that companies should all be able to publish whatever information they wanted. That if you want to put out quarterly reports because you think it's in your interest, you should do it. And that's not the idea that I'm pushing here. I'm really saying that, you know, perhaps everybody should have to publish everything. Now, the raw data would be such that few people could make sense of this on their own. And what would be likely to happen is that specialists would emerge to download, package, interpret the data. In fact, they might even be the big four accounting firms who would you know, diversify into this line of business. Um, I think that this is much more of a utopian idea, but it's also a very provocative one. And it's one that forces you to reconsider exactly why we have audits, why we, why we have companies provide financial information to the market in the form of quarterly earnings and balance sheets and so forth. And I think this open, real-time accounting is a radically different idea, um, one that's not going to happen tomorrow, but would completely remake the field of financial reporting in a way that is you know, perhaps much better than the system that we have now. Okay. Let's talk now briefly about smart contracts. And some of you may have a background in the law. If you've ever actually taken a contracts course in law school, I'd recommend that you download this article by a Hungarian mathematician named Nick Zabo, who 20 years ago proposed this idea. This is the cleverest thing I have ever seen in contract law. Zabo makes a simple observation that as written here, many of the things that get negotiated in contracts, like the conveyance of collateral upon default, are things that you could replicate in very basic computer code. Like, if you don't pay, the asset goes to this guy. So one of the examples that Zabo uses is the auto loan. That if I buy a car, I agree to 48 monthly payments. And if I miss a payment, they have the right to take me into court and get the car back. But this is expensive. It, you have to hire a lawyer. You have to deal with cases of forbearance. Typically, people 
you know, we'll let you miss two or three payments, and then they'll have to hire a repo man to steal the car out of your driveway. With a smart contract, as soon as you miss the first payment, you could shut off the car if it has one of these electronic keys. And if it's one of these Google cars, the car could just drive itself back to headquarters, right? <laughs> so this would remove the temptation to engage in what is called strategic default, you know, where you decide not to pay because you know you can get away with it. You know, this is the kind of thing that can make you president, but it's also the kind of thing that raises the cost of capital for everybody else. That car loans, if you buy a car today, you pay 4 or 5% perhaps, but that could be 2 or 3% if you had a technology like this in the background. This would benefit you know, everybody but the strategic defaulters. It would benefit the car companies and so forth. And the people it would take out of the equation, of course, are the lawyers because you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't hire lawyers. So we got rid of the accountants in the last slide, and this is getting rid of all the lawyers by just automating contract law. Now, Zabo is a very, very clever guy, and he says the original smart contract is the Coke machine, that if you put in your $2 with a high degree of certainty, it performs. It gives you the Coke. It doesn't consider strategic default. You know, it has no capacity. You can rely on a technology that's been replicated and proven to live up to the other side of the deal, and this makes you more willing to put in your money in the first place. If you read his treatise on smart contracts and then read the Satoshi Nakamoto paper from 2008, this is the same guy. You know, there's been a lot of speculation about who is Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, I think all you have to do is read the smart contracts paper and then read the Bitcoin paper. And it's, it's the same agenda, the same writing and so forth. And people have done text analysis. and all, a lot of people think that Zabo is really Satoshi. I think it's more likely a group of people of which he's a member. But um, this is a guy who's always out there being quoted and has a huge amount of prominence in the distributed ledger digital currency community because he was really you know, 20 years into this, you know, years before anybody else really was thinking of many of these things. So how would we see this in corporate finance? I think secure debt, which many, many companies issue, is one of the most straightforward applications of a smart contract. That basically secure debt means that you're posting collateral and that ownership of that would change contingently if you didn't perform or default. So you could just have a smart contract that if somebody either didn't make their payments or maybe fell out of compliance with the financial ratios that you agreed to as a minimum set of liquidity conditions or whatever, that that would essentially convey directly from the debtor to the creditor without any need for a foreclosure procedure, a bankruptcy hearing, or anything like that. Now, I think it's easy to see that more complex contracts could be written, but what this would amount to is pre-contracting the resolution of financial distress. Now, this is a major topic in corporate finance, though, what to do when people don't pay. And it's understood, if you guys have done cost of equity, that you always tack on to the end like 3% for the cost of financial distress times the probability that you might get distressed and so forth. Um, a lot of the faculty here, in fact, have been heavily involved in researching this, trying to benchmark it, measure it, and so forth. So here, you could really head this stuff out of the system in advance with well-drawn smart contracts. And things like restrictive covenants, which are sort of quick and dirty solutions to strategic behavior, these might become unnecessary, that we would have simpler debt contracts, cheaper to draw. And the bottom line is the last bullet point here, that the cost of debt should become cheaper, that companies could issue debt at a much lower cost, and in the end, this is the kind of thing, of course, that benefits everybody. It allows entrepreneurs to raise money, jobs are created, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're doing here is really defeating the problems of adverse selection and moral hazard that are timeless concerns about people in the debt markets and are the foundations of many of the academic models and theories we have about why companies issue certain kinds of debt and what contingencies are placed on them and so forth. I think this is an extremely promising area that even if you set aside some of the things about digital currency, that the, the idea of a smart contract where you use code to 
essentially mechanize and automate the promises of people and enforce them not by courts of law but by technology, um, it seems like an idea that has legs that, that will migrate into many aspects of consumer finance. In fact, it probably already has if you think about this in many directions. Now, a lot can go wrong here. And a lot already has. So you could make mistakes in the code. And even if you agree that there's a mutual mistake, it's not clear that there's a basis for rewinding and going back. Um, you can have poorly drafted code that leads to a death spiral, the kind of recursive code that shouldn't be recursive. If you've done any programming, you should understand what this means. Um, stuff that essentially lets the horse out of the barn in such a way that you can't get the horse back and the damage is, is very hard to remedy. And I want to talk about this in a moment in the context of Ethereum in this organization called the DAO, which is an event that happened over the course of last summer and has raised a lot of interesting questions. The other thing that I think you have to be concerned about here is the role of the courts not just for efficiency reasons, but for reasons of equity and justice. So we don't foreclose on the homes of people who don't pay their mortgage if they're in the military or if they have cancer or if they're over the age of 80 because courts just don't let this happen for reasons of compassion and equity. Most plaintiffs know better than to even try to do this, but courts essentially impose not only mechanical interpretations of the rule of law, but also wisdom and ideas of fairness that are part of the culture. You lose a lot of that if you go to a world of smart contracts where everything is mechanized. And I think it's a step that, as a society, you have to think very carefully about. If do, you, do you really want to purge the, the courts of all notions of equity and fairness in favor of pure efficiency? Or if you want to retain those things, at what cost? You know, what, what's the cost in, in potential efficiency gains that, that you might give up? This is a problem that comes up in a lot of law school courses. And I think smart contracts focus you and give you even more data to think about this in, in a very rigorous way that maybe hasn't been possible before. So I think these things are here to stay, and these questions are going to be raised in many settings involving both business and personal life. And it's going to be... Um, Something to keep law professors busy, certainly for many more years, but also, I think, highlight many ways in which the job of lawyers is likely to change as you confront these issues more and more in the field of technology and computer code. Now, let's talk about the DAO. And I'm bringing this up because it's, I think, going to be very famous for many years as an example of a smart contract run amok. So, what is the DAO? It stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. This is a corporation with no employees that is run entirely by computer code. And there are futuristic thinkers that believe many businesses could be designed like this looking forward. That if computers are so smart with artificial intelligence coming along and so forth, that, you know, why do we need CEOs and employees? Why not just code everything up and let these organizations run themselves? So people thought that this was maybe 10, 20, 50 years down the road, but someone decided to start one of these things. And this was part of the Ethereum project. Ethereum is a digital currency, somewhat similar to Bitcoin, but with other capabilities. And it's run by a genius in Zug, Switzerland, named Vitaly Buterin. I think he's like 22 years old, and he's the guru of this whole movement. Um, the DAO was supposed to be a robo-venture capitalist. So it was going to raise money and then select investments, all without any employees, just using a mechanical process, and then eventually pay out the profits to the investors. Now, would you put your money into this? It's up to you, but this thing raised $150 million very quickly after it went live. So this was in April, and it was successful to the extent that obviously everybody else was saying, hey, I'm going to start a DAO too. Maybe somebody will send me $150 or, or my robot or you know, whatever. So you know, this, 
got the attention of many, many people. And Vitaly was being promoted as you know the next Nick Zabo or whatever. You know, and you know everyone was really excited. And then it was hacked. <laughs> and so it's about six weeks after they raised the money. One night, in fact, this is exactly the day. And you know, the morning of June seventeenth, everybody woke up, and about a third of the money was gone. And this wasn't totally surprising because a professor at Cornell had been ranting against this thing and published a list of, here's 10 vulnerabilities of the DAO. And in fact, the hackers appear to have read this list, you know, and, oh, yeah, let's take the money. And um, it's still controversial whether the hackers were motivated by greed or by trying to do a public service by pointing out that people were moving a little too fast with this technology. We will um, continue to learn more about this. But there was balloting on a website called Coindesk, which is a, a news provider for digital assets. And the DAO hacker was voted person of the year in the crypto world. You know, as the leading newsmaker, the person who succeeded in raising the most interesting issues and so forth. Now, this showed that clearly there's unintended consequences to even the most famous smart contracts. But what was really interesting was how did this thing get cleaned up in the aftermath? What happened was the Ethereum people voted to rewind the blockchain to the night before the hack. And so this is something called a hard fork. A fork is where you upload a new version of the code and invite people to follow your fork. And if more than half follow the fork, that becomes the main trunk of the blockchain. So you can do this, as I mentioned, <coughs> I mentioned this yesterday, you can do this with Bitcoin, that any of you could write a new code tonight. And if you can get 51% of the miners to start using your software, um, it would be a hard sell. But nevertheless, this in principle could happen. Now, with the people at Ethereum kind of leading the way, they got 85% of the people to take the hard fork. And this was where the hackers showed up was on this block. And they said, well, let's just go back to the, you know, the one before. And here's going to be the new chain. So this picture comes straight from the website of Ethereum. Now, 15% didn't go along with this. And I think a few of these people lost money from the hard fork. And you know, this is probably why they wouldn't support it. But most of them really objected in principle to what had happened. Because there's really two things that really should never occur. Um, one is that you've rewritten history, that you've gone back you know, think about October 29th on the stock market. You know, we all wish it never happened, right? Let's just go back to October 28th and, and, and have a do-over. Um, the other is that you have a smart contract where code is law. You know, whatever is written is supposed to be what's enforced, and there's supposed to be no possibility of human intervention, but in fact, humans intervene and stopped the smart contract in the middle. And I think you can look at this situation and say, you know, these people were a little too excited, mistakes were made, let's do it over. But you've set a precedent here that arguably is going to be referenced by anybody on a blockchain where things go bad. And what the long run significance of this is, is going to be very interesting to see. I would have been in the 15%. I, I think that you know, despite the fact that these people lost a third of the money, you've got to stick, you know, with the principles of the system and not set these kinds of precedents that are, in the end, going to undermine the whole technology. But the reality is that the technology is such that a democracy can overturn, you know, what's good for a minority. So even on Bitcoin, I think everybody knows that the number of Bitcoins is fixed, that in the end there can't be more than 21 million Bitcoins at least until they vote to change it, right? And you know, there's a lot of talk about how you have an algorithmic monetary policy. We'll come back to this tomorrow. But it's really only as good as the willingness of the majority to tolerate the rules. And I think in the world we live in, it's often you know, relatively easy to persuade enough people to change the rules when it's in their, in their interest to do so. So 
let me stop at this point. I really haven't gotten too deep into the governance stuff, but we'll pick up on some of these issues tomorrow. Tomorrow's lecture, though, mostly will, about, will be about central banks and the government as the issuer of digital currency and all the things that this may imply for the banking system going forward. And I think these are quite interesting. Ironically, many of them revived something called the Chicago Plan that was proposed in the 1930s as a radical way that you might change the banking system. So let me stop, and we're going to take questions as we did yesterday. And I think the plan is to pass microphones around the audience so that the questions can be audible. So um, if you know, maybe people would raise their hand. Who has the mics? OK. Hi. With Hi. Uh, instant trade settlement uh, and full transparency as to who owns what, uh, what role, if any, do you see for market makers or high frequency traders in this scenario you've outlined? Yeah, these are interesting questions. Um, I think the role of the market maker may no longer exist, that you would just have people posting supply and demand on bulletin boards, and you wouldn't really need buffers of inventory, although maybe people would do it as a speculative thing. And, and, and we'd have to see. Um, I, I'd have to think more about it, but it's not obvious they would continue to exist. Um, the other group you asked about was whom? Yeah, high-frequency traders. Um, under current technology, I don't think they could accommodate the frequency. Um, but I think with technical improvements, the, it, it may be much the same as it is today. But I think those are the constraints that you have. The, the market that we now play in, I think, accommodates high-frequency traders better than a, a naive blockchain market. But I think maybe a, a market with a blockchain behind it would, would allow you to even amp up the frequency beyond what it is. Um, you'd probably need to talk to specialists to get a better answer about this, though. Um, yes? Uh, hi. I was wondering, how do you deal with uh, the assignment of wallets? So like, the way it works currently, at least on the Bitcoin blockchain, is that if you own my wallet, it's like a bearer bond. Uh, how would you assign that to a person? Like I was thinking from the corporate finance perspective, uh, I could do some Enron type stuff and basically have another wallet that I would trade with and then yeah. stuff back Yeah, in. Wallets are not really assigned. They're just created that you can you know, make a wallet for yourself and the network will just give you one every time you ask for it. And there are people who go to the length of changing their wallet for every single transaction. Now, I think that at a certain level, this may actually work. That if you're trying to stay a step ahead of the wallet police, that you know, just rapidly changing your address. But in the end, I think they'll catch up with you. That any system like this can be tracked and inverted by people with the right software. So, you know, there's enough Edward Snowdens in the world and so forth that I, I'm not sure that you could really outsmart the people with an interest in catching you. Yep. People say this, but then I look at Ross Ulbricht rotting in jail. Um, I, I really don't think they have as much trouble tracking drug dealers as, as, you know, as has been said many times, buying drugs on the blockchain is about the dumbest thing you can do. Because even if they can't track you in real time, you've left the footprints that they, you know, come back in a year and say, oh, I know who that was now. You know, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but in the end, this is a, a subjective disagreement that I really think the tools exist, and if they don't, they'll be developed to track people's wallets pretty easily. Um, um, yeah. So after this hard fork, there's two versions operating of the Ethereum yeah. blockchain. Right. And in one of them, $50 million is owned by X, and in the other one, $50 million is owned by Y. Yeah, you can spend the same work. token twice. You just have to find someone willing to receive it. So what you have now is two currencies. One's called Ethereum, and the other's called Ethereum Classic. And they both have their own market values. And everyone's cheering for Ethereum Classic, the minority, to overtake you know, the legacy. But you can double spend the same token twice, absolutely. And you, it's bad. I mean, these schisms, it's like two popes, right? And you know, one in Rome, one in Avignon. And in the end, this makes it very unstable. This is not what they wanted to happen. They thought everyone would go down the hard fork, but they didn't.
Um, I have a commentary on one of the last questions about the role for market makers. Yes. Uh, I think sort of the best data that we have available that's sort of experimental would be some sort of online game where there is this sort of market set settle instantly. And I've seen that sometimes you can, a uh, uh, role for market makers can arise if the, if the agents that aren't basically financial intermediaries want to have their trades clear instantly. There needs to be market makers floating some stock to make sure both buyers and sellers yeah. can clear immediately. They're providing a buffer, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't rule out that this could happen. And there are people who are specialists in micro, micro, microstructure who would know much more about this. And I guess one could concern that one might have about trades being irreversible is it w would potentially make it easier for well we've seen it up here where like if if we never make hard forks it's very possible for hackers to get away with money and we see identity yeah. theft all the time where someone pretends to meet me uh, uses their credit card my credit card to buy a bunch of stuff for them and right now the current system ha gives me protection against that happening to me or perhaps if an armed robber demands I turn over the contents of my bank account and all my assets to him I have to comply and if I can't reverse that that might lead to more incentive to make armed robberies. I, I think these are very interesting points. And I would send you right back to the Satoshi paper, where in the very opening paragraph, he talks about the cost of dispute resolution on the internet becoming overwhelming and is a drag on commerce. So, you know, the counter argument is that the kinds of problems you're talking about are rare, but we spend 3% of every credit card swipe you know, to, to guard against the few cases, you know, which is a better system? Is it, is it worth having all this huge drag in the background that in the end clogs up the pipes and reduces the opportunities for commerce? Or should you load much more responsibility onto people to protect themselves, to safeguard their passwords, to not go where they're going to be robbed and so forth? And um, it's a very interesting choice that doesn't necessarily offer up a middle ground because Satoshi takes out a very extreme position with the blockchain. But you know, I, I agree that the arguments you're raising are very interesting and it, they have to be balanced against the costs of all this protection that, that may or may not in the end be worth it. Like, it would and, be an interesting question. How much of percentage of the production of the U Chicago police's patrol areas spent supporting the security force, which is partially effective, but not even totally effective at deterring armed robberies. Yeah, I think it is an interesting question. It's the kind of thing Gary Becker used to think about all the time, right? So let me move on to um, another, yeah. Yesterday, uh, actually, I was thinking of this exactly uh, at the end of your lecture yesterday, and I'm thinking, isn't this inherently something we'll continue seeing, considering that there's very few people mining versus the potential users in the system? So if the miners collude and say, we're going to change it and keep doing it, you'll have endless forks as long as some other person is willing to accept it. Yeah. You know, one of the huge problems with Bitcoin is that there are what are called mining pools, where not only are there a relatively small number of miners, but they work on a mutual basis. So rather than me hopelessly try to mine. I work with a hundred other miners and we each take one one hundredth of each other's profits. And you have three or four big mining pools that control the whole network. And they're able to veto any change by as long as they work together. So it's an oligopoly. And it's not at all what Satoshi Nakamoto had in mind. And it's not any kind of pure democracy. It's you're captive to a cartel. So this is what is preventing the scaling up of the Bitcoin network, is that you have to persuade the people in the mining pools that to make their old hardware obsolete is really good for them, and this is not obviously something they're going to support. So I'm not sure how you solve this problem. In the end, it falls into the category of what we call mechanism design, which is you know, a field of economics that um, Nobel Prize was awarded, I think, to someone from this university a couple of years ago. And um, it's, I, I think the people who designed all this knew an awful lot about cryptography, computer science, not so much about game theory, adverse selection. 
Um, I was invited to address a tech conference a couple of years ago. And I said, I know nothing about this. I'm an economist. And they said, well, we know nothing about economics. And you know, we need to hear this. It was a very interesting afternoon. And then I got a phone call from the chief scientist at VeriSign the next day, who was there. He said, I want to come up and spend a day with you and talk some of this through. And, and we did. Um, I think that game theory people have an awful lot to add to this, and that the better systems of the future will probably benefit from some of these insights in, in microeconomics and, and strategic interaction and so forth. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here to, to make these things work better, and I think over time this probably will happen. Um, hi. Uh, hi, here. So I've lost the microphone. Yeah. Uh, so if, if we combine bitcoins to smart contracts, doesn't it raise questions about ownership of bitcoins like who really would be owning these are are people who have these bitcoins custodians of bitcoins or do they own it because basically some algorithm can take it away from them if in case some law they don't follow so yeah no this is a question that is very important in the law which is the difference between possession and ownership and these works of th these Rules have been worked out really over centuries, and they're answered different ways in different societies. So definitely we can track possession on the blockchain. But whether something's been lent out or pledged as collateral, and whether it's contingent or unconditional, all of this feeds into existing areas of the law. In the US, we have the Uniform Commercial Code, which deals with these issues in really a lot of detail. And I think a lot of the existing law can be mapped pretty directly into Bitcoin and the blockchain in ways that make these questions not as ambiguous as you may be fearing. But I think inevitably the technology will open new areas of ambiguity. The American Bar Association has a whole section now on blockchain law where specialists are considering these things as they come up. But I think this is good that you know, the law always evolves with technology and it's probably going to have to evolve a little bit faster going forward because of this. Thanks. Yep. Um. Um, I have a quick question from the, con uh, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, so we talked about the development of the Bitcoin blockchain and the uses for it and looks like it's a huge space. What do you think needs to be in place for consumers to start adapting that? And uh, kind of how do you see that you know, becoming real? You can adopt it you know, even now. And the, the user interfaces and the mobile apps that exist to use this are really quite simple to use. I think what consumers, though, need above all is a supply of merchants. You know, one thing that's fun is to go meet these Bitcoin people in New York and say, let's go get a cup of coffee and, and pay with Bitcoin. And they say, oh, no, 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 not impossible. I said, but it's New York. It's the biggest city in the world. They say, yeah, there's really no coffee shops that take it yet. And so there are apps that have lists of Bitcoin merchants, you know, where you can actually go spend Bitcoins and so forth. But they are few and far between. And, you know, the take-up rate, especially... Not, not among consumers, but among, among merchants, is not what it needs to be to make it worthwhile for consumers to adopt it. So I think it's really a supply problem more than a technology problem. But um, you know, over time, it, it may change just due to you know, the forces of, of the market. And I think it, it probably will. Thank you. OK, you know, with a lot of people leaving for class and so forth, I think we should stop at this point. I'm happy to hang around and talk one-on-one -on -one with people. But for those interested, see you guys again at noon tomorrow. Thank you.